show here on RCR TV. I'm your show host, Lamore Schaffman. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And what we're talking about is cybersecurity, because as you know, we are becoming increasingly connected. That's what this show is all about, all about right? It's about the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything as this is also referred to. So as our world becomes increasingly connected, as we have more and more data, our personal data, our secure data, our, our, our health data, everything is being, our enterprise data, everything is being put up into the cloud. We have links happening all the way from central servers all the way to the edge. We are becoming increasingly reliant and we've just hitting the tip of the iceberg at this point on applications that involve end-to-end -end technology. We know from experience that our, strong, our strength, our strongest point is really our weakest link. And so the question is, given all this multiplicity of links that are being built over time, how are we going to manage the situation that we're going to be in in terms of cybersecurity and cybercrime? Because we know, right, that it's about managing it. It's not about evading it. It's not about stopping it. Uh, unless our guest is going to take up, tell us otherwise, I think it's really about managing that process and managing how to keep things as secure as possible. And with me to, here today to help us understand what in fact are the possibilities and what are the dangers as well is Rick Ferguson. He is Vice President of Security Research at Trend Micro. Rick, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. So, Rick, tell us a little bit about what are we really seeing here um, in this market of M to M and where all this machinery, quote unquote, and I know that's not machinery necessarily, sometimes it is, but really it's software, it's networks, it's so many different layers of connectivity that are coming into effect as our M to M ecosystem grows and grows across multiplicity of industries. What do you see happening down the line in terms of what we need to do to to really protect ourselves? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Certainly, in the as regards the Internet of Things, as regards more and more um, devices coming online, the adoption of IPv6, um, and also a lot of devices that are becoming connected, which were never really architected with security in mind. Unfortunately, that still happens. You know, we like to think that. Um, devices architected without security in mind is something we left behind. Um, but it, I think it's true to say that, you know, car manufacturers, running shoe manufacturers, um, pacemaker manufacturers, these people don't really have security first and foremost in their mind when they're thinking about adding connectivity to their devices. Um, when, when you consider this world, um, and also consider the, the kind of complementary information acquisition and information presentation type technologies that we're seeing, um, the likes of um, Google Glass, where um, you know we're really going to begin to experience the real world through the filter of the web for the first time. Instead of the web being some discrete thing that we go off and, and consult separately, it's actually going to be overlaid on, on everything that we do. Um, it offers a lot of scope. It offers a lot of scope, obviously, first and foremost, for, um, for development, for growth, for enjoyment, uh, for business, but it, of course it offers a lot of scope for um, criminal endeavor as well. Um, interestingly, actually, that you asked that question because I'm actually a part of a, a project which is being run by an organization called ICSPA, um, and Trend Micro and Europol have been working together on that project, which is basically to look at the next decade or so of technologies and to look at the the business and criminal, the technological and the criminal possibilities that, that may arise. Um, so first and foremost, I think one of the things to consider is that for all the stuff that's going to be connected, for all the stuff that's going to be coming online or is already online, um, there will be some element of an operating system in that device. It's not going to be, be you know, connected without some underlying operating system. And if you look at current trends, then certainly um, the most likely contender in today's world anyway um, is Android. And what's really interesting when we look at Android and look at what's happening now and what's happened over the last couple of years is the fact that criminals have really zeroed in, really focused on Android as, a, as an opportunity, as a platform um, for criminal endeavor. You know, we're seeing growth in Android malware, which I think it's fair to say is quicker than growth we've ever seen before in any operating system in terms of, of malware and, and uh, opportunities for exploitation. 
And if I may ask, is this because they're seeing Android as one of the proliferating operating systems that's going to outdo Apple and outrun um, Microsoft as well? I think there's a couple of good reasons for it. One is that criminals follow user behavior. Criminals follow money. So you know, the, at the end of the day, in most cases anyway, the drive for the, the certainly the widespread cybercrime is making money. Um, and as we as individuals move away from the, the desktop operating system, um, you know, the, the, the Mac OS, the Windows of the world, uh, and move more towards um, tablets, smartphones, or any other um, small, small format connected device, um, criminals will follow that behavior. Because if they don't, they're not going to be able to take our money anymore. And taking our money is, is basically what they want to do at the end of the, end of the world. Um, but why Android? It's, it, you know, it's, it certainly has the majority market share when it comes to numbers of handsets out there, um, not necessarily numbers of tablets, but if you look at numbers of endpoints running Android, it has uh, market, the, the biggest market share. But also it has a few other um, factors, anomalies, things that make it a little bit attractive, a little bit more attractive to criminals. Um, one is certainly its openness. So um, Android is a very open ecosystem by design. Um, there are many different versions of Android from many different vendors. Um, you know, you've got Samsung's Android and HTC's Android and Google's Android, and because any, any, it's open source, anybody's free to take it and make it their own. Um, but more importantly, the concept of third-party app stores is deeply embedded within Android, so it, it's completely normal that you don't only get your apps from Google Play, that you go to other third-party environments to get them as well. Some very big and well-known, some small and specialized, but they, they exist. Um, and it's that openness and that ease of distribution of malware that has really attracted criminals to the platform. Um, and if you want to talk numbers, by the end of, uh, oh, actually I can give you a number for by the end of this week because I just got a report today. Um, we are now talking about, for the Android platform alone, uh, apps that Trend Micro have classified as being either outright malicious or high risk. Um, 740,000 unique malicious apps just for the Android platform. Oh my uh, god, that is about out of how many apps do they have out there now? Do you know? Um, well, it's difficult to say because the, the number that we get certainly from Google Play is how many apps do they have available on the store right now and obviously we're looking at the, the historical view, how many apps have we um, investigated up until now. Some of them might not be publicly available anymore, some of them might be updates rather than apps. Um, but you know, for an idea of scale that there's, according to Google, around 2 million apps available on Google Play, uh, and of all the ones that we've investigated, which is Google Play and any other source that we can find, there are some other very big app stores, for example, in Japan, in China, um, we've, we've got uh, yeah, 740,000 uh, unique. But what's really surprising and interesting for me about that is that even a couple of months ago, it was true to say that the level of malware for the mobile platform, it took the PC 10 years of malware growth to reach the point that Android got to in three years. So it's, you know, it, it's like I said, the malware and the criminal interest in that platform is growing pretty much faster than anything we've seen before. We well, made a prediction at the beginning of the year that we'd see more than a million malicious apps for Android by the end of this year. Unfortunately, it looks like we're going to have underestimated again. And that's astonishing. So, and it sounds like it is the openness. So let's. And it sounds like it's the openness and the money. And I'm sure there are some other reasons. Um, let's talk a little bit about this, the money part, actually, because I'm not sure that everyone understands how cybersecurity and cybercrime rather works, and what the incentives are. So, can you tell us a little bit in terms of what is driving these hackers and these and these um, criminals who want to? Is it the data that they want to access, and that's what they resell? Or can you tell us a little bit about that ecosystem? Yeah, there, there are a number of different ways that that um, the criminals make money. You know, some of it is simple data theft and resale, as you mentioned. Um, whether that's taking over your personal computer or your mobile device, finding what information can be found stealing it until you clean it up and then moving on and stealing somebody else's data and all of that stuff is resold whether it's names, addresses, social security numbers, credit card details, dates of birth, passwords, answers to secret questions, anything and everything that can be had from an end user will be um, taken and, and resold. Um, obviously the ecosystem is much wider than that, it's not just the sale of data but it's also the criminal 
use of that data to make fraudulent transactions. So um, the data that's resold is then used for financial crime. There are other kinds of malware which are designed to commit financial crime directly. So to jump into any online banking session that you're doing from your infected PC and to begin to use your PC to make transfers and transactions which you haven't um, initiated or, or authorized in any way. Um, there's other kinds of malware which we call ransomware, which, um, as the name would suggest, simply holds your data, your PC, to ransom. Um, if you're infected by ransomware, it will encrypt the contents of your machine and in one way or another pre present you with a message, maybe a pop-up box, maybe changing your desktop background in one way or another, that says um, the contents of your PC have been encrypted. If you ever want to see them again, you have to pay us some money. That was how it started. Uh, and you were instructed to make a payment, and then via email you would receive a decryption key. But we've certainly seen that ransomware thing develop over time as well, um, where now we see messages that say, uh, this is the police. This is a message from the police. We've found um, copyright content on your PC, or we've found child exploitation material on your PC, uh, and your PC has been locked. You have to pay a fine, and you believe that you're paying a fine to the police. Um, other ways that, that uh, cybercrime can be monetized, um, if your machine is recruited into a botnet or a, a network of compromised computers which are under the control of a third party, the, the criminal, um, it can be used in a number of ways which can be um, uh, monetized by the criminal. So your computer could be used to take part in a DDoS, a denial of service attack, so to bombard another website with data from thousands or tens of thousands of PCs of which yours could be one. And obviously, botnet owners will sell the use or rent the use of their botnet to other people to carry out attacks on their behalf. Um, your PC could be used uh, to generate and send spam. That's very, very common. We see um, you know, millions, millions of PCs uh, on a regular basis being used to generate pretty much all the spam that everybody sees in their inbox across the world will come from somebody else's compromised PC that's part of a botnet being used by criminals. Um, so there are many, many different ways that, that compromised PCs, malware, and criminal behavior can be used to generate money. Um, one of the, the more recent developments um, that we've seen in, in the criminal world is of much more targeted attacks. So where traditional cybercrime was very scattergun, uh, very immediate, and very direct, so there was a direct relationship between attacker and victim, um, what we're seeing now in a targeted attack is much more that selected individuals, groups, or businesses are being researched. The attack is being carried out against those people. Um, and the goal is to maintain a presence within that victim network or company for a prolonged period of time so that data can be stolen on an ongoing basis. And this is very common for nation state sponsored activity and for industrial espionage type activity. So it sounds like, taking this back to our world of M2M, it sounds like that it becomes increasingly insidious for the kinds of connectivity that we're talking about, particularly when we have so many enterprises that are reliant on the same networks and sharing so many things in order to exchange data from one point to another. So are you seeing this, are we seeing this increase, do you think, because of the advent as well of M to M and how connected things are growing? Is that a factor? Um, certainly that's a factor and I think uh, particularly, again, in the world of mobile, um, there's, a, there's a lot of attraction there from a, from a criminal perspective because there's a lot of data and capability on a mobile device which is simply not present on a, um, on a fixed PC. And we've absolutely seen evidence that targeted attackers are developing malicious software not only for traditional platforms but also for mobile platforms so that, for example, when they compromise a PC that belongs to um, the CEO of an organization and they know that say he has a board meeting at one o'clock this afternoon the other very attractive target is going to be to compromise the mobile device because they can see the guy's calendar and they might say oh we want to be part of this meeting so if we can compromise his mobile device we can simply activate the microphone and record the entire proceedings of the meeting or we can turn on the video camera or we can take snapshots or we can track GPS or whatever's relevant and attractive so the more devices that we see coming online, whether it's wearable technology, in-car technology, RFID stuff, um, criminals will absolutely be looking to exploit the opportunities presented by those devices. You know, one, one example, for example, smart TV, 
think about the ransomware that I was talking about already. Think about having a smart TV in your home, um, which is connected to, to the wider world. Uh, what a great criminal opportunity if you are on pay-per-view, have paid to watch the big game tonight, you've already made your payment and you're ready to go, you don't know that your TV's been compromised, and seconds before the game, the screen goes black and a message pops up and says, hey, we know you were going to watch the game right now, uh, but you won't be watching it unless you make an additional payment of $10. Thanks very much. Wow, and are they doing that? Is that happening already right now? I'm just proposing criminal scenarios where where technology could lead to um, other avenues of monetization. You know, what we need to do is to be able to look forwards and think, what are the implications of these technologies? Right. Um, the more widely they're adopted, the more likely they are to be abused, um, and that was something that just popped into my head as an idea. <laughs> Don't give them any more ideas. Um, <laughs> but, you know, going back to the CEO who is in the conference room, um, a couple of questions came to mind. One, I heard that actually the, for example, for example, the Samsung Galaxy, uh, I guess is the 4, is it the 4 that's the latest one that's out right now, that that because of the way there is something with the technology, because of the way the camera and the conferencing system in, in the cell phone is set up, that it actually makes it that much more vulnerable to in fact be remotely turned on. Is, is that actually correct? Um, do you know what? Any, any mobile device where the app has been granted the requisite permissions um, is vulnerable to that kind of attack. Um, you know, I have a piece of proof of concept stuff. It's just an app. Um, it's accessing the hardware on the device because you, the user, gave it permission to do that. Um, it's very simple. You know, the, any Android handset that has that hardware functionality is vulnerable to being exploited in that way. And actually, at the end of the day, it's not the hardware itself that's being exploited. It's the end user, and that's really no different to what we've seen throughout you know, time immemorial is that it's actually the person that's being exploited um, technologically, but it's the person that's being exploited. We, you know, we tend, we're installing an app on a, on a mobile device, and you get the screen that pops up and says, here are the permissions. Uh, the, the app that you're installing wants to access A, B, C, D, E, and F. Are you cool with that? Um, and half the time, we don't even read the screen. And if we do read it, um, we're not entirely sure what it is we're agreeing to anyway because we're too impatient to, to actually get to the app that we've already decided that we absolutely need on our mobile device. Well, I have to say, one of the things that's actually preventing me from downloading a lot of apps right now because I have a new cell phone is the fact that I am reading that, that language. And they want everything. They want my contacts. They want all my data. They want to track where I am. They want everything. And I don't get to choose. And I'm, buying, I'm downloading a game. And yeah. I'm like, what has that got to do with the game? No. There's, there's and I'm frustrated because I want that game. Yeah, there's a culture of over-requesting permissions that has grown up among app developers without a shadow of a doubt. And it's true that on Android, unfortunately, you don't get that granular level of choice that says, yeah, I'll allow this one, but not this one and this one. Um, with Is iOS, you can do that. With iOS, you get that choice, but not with Android. Okay, and actually, do you think uh, do you think that's going to change? Or because people are become are people? This is the question rather than a statement. Are pe people becoming more aware? Are developers becoming more aware of the issues out there in terms of cybersecurity? Are they even caring enough so that they're going to change how they're doing their setups so that when we have clients being downloaded onto our cell phones, that we're actually getting only what we need, and they're getting only what they need. Yeah, it's a, you know it's a tough question. I think the the best solution to that is that something is done on an operating system level, and that's that's one of two big changes that I would like to see in Android. Um, you know, giving the user granular control over permissions that have been requested by an app. So you might say, at install time, I have to accept all of this stuff, but I'm free to go in on a per app basis and limit those permissions one by one. I would love to see that brought in. That's an operating system change, not not an app change. Um, the other thing is that I would like to see in Android the possibility for uh, a granular level of trust when it comes to third-party marketplaces. Because right now, you enable side loading or you don't enable it. You enable to install apps from a third-party marketplace or you don't. You don't get to say I trust Amazon and Google, but I don't trust anybody else. You basically say I trust everyone or I trust Google. Uh, and that, that question's not good enough anymore. So those are the two big things I would like to see. The other big problem, though, with Android, and again, this contributes to its attractiveness when it comes to exploitation, is that it's a very fragmented um, 
ecosystem. There are different versions of Android from different manufacturers at different revision levels on so many devices out there that asserting any kind of control over that is very difficult. And if you've bought an older device, um, any kind of assurance that you're going to get the latest updates, patches, even if it's just security patches, is pretty much non-existent. Um, and it's a difficult one to fight unless the operating system manufacturer works out some, and I mean Google, works out some central way of being able to push out updates to everybody regardless of whose version of Android it is. Right. Um, because, you know, you could quite easily argue that the handset manufacturer, their prime motivation is, well, you know, if you're not happy with the features and functionality on the device you've got, we can sell you another one. So you would think it, would, it might be in their interest, um, but uh, probably giving their the way they think about their costs and what they think about their clients, I'm not sure, us, meaning our, the purchases, I'm not sure that they're going to come up with that. Uh, one thought that actually came to mind is I see a new business for Trend Micro, and that is creating an app store mm -hmm. of reviewed and approved apps that are hack-free. You know um, what? We've gone one step better than that already. Oh, uh, tell me. Yeah, we have... Uh, uh, a service called Mobile App Reputation Services, and it's a back-end service. It's what we use for our Trend Micro mobile security product, the, the anti-malware product for mobile platforms. It's what we use for the back-end of that to classify apps to malicious, high-risk, medium, low-risk, and so on. But we also sell it as a back-end technology to other people who run app stores. So if you're an organization that has a big app store, and you want to differentiate yourself from other app stores, one of the things you can do is say, by the way, every app that we provide has already been scanned by Trend Micro, um, so we're not giving you any malware. So it's a back-end service that if you run an app store, you can say, I want mobile app reputation services, and I want to tell my customers that everything is already scanned and clean, and they don't have to worry about it. That's great. And actually, now this brings brings me into another area that I was curious about, the BYOD, which is a big, big issue and a big point of conversation yeah. here in Washington, D.C., among all the chief op information officers at the different government agencies. Um, you know, how do we protect our devices? And I'm just thinking, I believe some of them have app stores. And yeah. if they use this kind of secure system that you're offering as part of their app store, at least they would know that that part of the apps being downloaded on devices that are being brought in uh, by because they're already owned by the users, by the employees, that maybe there's some level of security that's offering there. What are you seeing with, are they in fact using this kind of system? And what are you seeing from a BYOD perspective? What should CIOs actually keep in mind? BYOD is a tough one, and I think the first thing that CIOs need to keep in mind is that it's impossible to say no. Um, you can believe that you've said no, but you can be absolutely certain that if you have said no, um, there will be people still bringing their own device anyway. Um, the age of being able to oblige your employees to carry two devices, their own and the company's, is well and truly gone. Um, and even if you don't have a BYOD policy within the organization, it's actually pretty simple to set up a device to connect to corporate resources in one way or another, whether that's just simple retrieval of email or whether it's joining the corporate VPN. Um, and it's relatively difficult to, uh, to find out if that's happening under the radar, so to speak. So the first thing that CIOs need to keep in mind is that they need to say yes, but um, they don't need to say yes to everything for everyone. And I think one of the most important things to do is to look at who in your organization has access to which kinds of data and to, to lay down the, the rules for those kinds of people. Obviously, you need to invest in a mobile device management solution, a mobile security solution, preferably one that does both without needing two screens, so mobile device management and security. Um, but you need to look at those devices. Like I said, Android itself is a very fragmented operating system. Um, it's also not one that has been designed really for enterprise. It's a consumer operating system. Um, Apple initially, iOS initially was a consumer operating system, but they over time have been adding um, MDM APIs, management functionality um, and hooks. Um, RIM with BlackBerry OS, obviously that was designed for the enterprise to begin with. Uh, and Windows Phone, you know, that's something that you can manage with your existing Microsoft management structure as well. So we did a study actually to try and decide which was the most appropriate for, for enterprise, the most securable, the most appropriate. At the time of the study, which admittedly was about 12 months ago, but not too much has changed in the interve intervening period, BlackBerry came out on top. They're certainly less popular right now from a hardware handset perspective. Fewer people have them. 
But still, from a management and security perspective, it's the richest feature set, particularly if you're running a BlackBerry Enterprise server to manage them. Second, actually, came iOS because of the work that Apple has done in enabling those MDM features, um, being able to lock down functionality, being able to uh, place restrictions and manage all of that um, centrally. Very close to that was Windows Phone because of the, the overarching Microsoft management infrastructure. And right at the end came Android because, uh, unfortunately, at the time, the majority of devices that you could buy were still running Android 2. something. Um, and even now, the amount that are running Android 4. something is still not really satisfactory. There are still many devices that run older versions. Um, and from those devices, you know, many important security features, even things as simple as full device encryption, were just missing. And certainly, MDM features were missing. But So you need to look at what your company has and say yes, but not to everything for everyone. So you might say, if you're in a senior management position, you can bring your own device, but it must be a BlackBerry or an Apple. We're not going to allow you to bring your own. Oops, lost you there for a second. Rick, are you still with us? We're having some minor technical difficulties. Rick, OK, I think we're back with you now. If you okay. can continue. I don't even know where I broke off. But what I'm basically saying is if somebody has a access to significant amount of sensitive information, then you need to make sure that you're allowing them to bring their own device, which is a securable device, whether that's iOS or BlackBerry. Um, if it's someone who has a lot less access to um, sensitive data, then why not allow them to bring an Android? But make sure that you're going to be able to enforce that it must be Android 4. something. And that's why doing your investigation up front into the, the MDM and the security solution, the mobile device management security, to make sure that you know what your policies are going to be, you know that you're capable of enforcing them, and then rolling, trying to roll that out across the business and, uh, and making it something that's living and breathing instead of just a paper policy. Right, right. That's absolutely key. So let's go back now to um, the products, actually, looking at the M2M products that you were talking about, because I think that's quite important. You said something that was really vital. From our the product developers, what do they need to do in order to make sure that the products and the, all the little tiny nuts and bolts that are being used to build out these M2M systems um, are actually secure? So from your perspective, what a product, we'll talk about networks in a moment, but what do product developers need to keep in mind and do, actually? Um, they're old lessons, to be honest. It's all about that um, secure development life cycle, something, you know, lessons that Microsoft learned you know, more than a decade ago, uh, it's, it's that um, security is something which should not be done afterwards. It's something which, which should be baked into the development process, any development process. Um, and to be honest, it's not just product development. I used to work at a big system integrator years ago. Um, and actually, even events that I've spoken at uh, with Trend Micro have shown me that this s still happens, unfortunately. Um, the, the architecture and the design teams and the security teams are still pretty much always separate. Um, you know, I was involved in designing infrastructure for government projects, for law enforcement projects, and, and, and blue, you know, big blue chip projects. Um, and the infrastructure design was done first, and then the infrastructure team would give their work over to the security team, and they would say, right, now secure that. And I remember speaking at an event recently, which was a, an infrastructure and security event, which unfortunately had two tracks. It had an infrastructure track and it had a security track. So the guys who build the infrastructure are going away and learning about the stuff they already know about, and the guys who do the security are learning about the stuff they already know about, and everybody comes away still with no clue what anybody else is doing. So whether it's product development or implementation or network design, it's about joining up those key functions um, right at the beginning of the project and not allowing them to, to, to fork into two separate things and trying to stitch them back together at the end of it. Yeah, more costly and not as effective, I'm sure. Absolutely. And so do you think, you know, I started off this program saying that we are going to, this is all about managing uh, cyber crime uh, and managing the security process as opposed to actually preventing cyber crime. Do you, am I right about that? Is it about managing it because it's going to inevitably happen? Yeah. Or, or is this actually something that we can shut down? 
Yeah, the only sensible way to approach uh, enterprise security, individual security, any kind of security is to assume that breach will happen. That's your first absolute number one assumption. Breach will happen. You need to design security which is um, retrospective. It's able to not only look at what's happening now, but it has a good eye on what has already happened. It's able to, uh, to enable systems to talk to one another so that um, an individual event someplace might on its own seem insignificant, but when it's put into a chain of parallel events or a chain of serial events, um, it suddenly gains significance and becomes something that you might want to investigate, so it needs to be retrospective security as well. Um, but it's, it's something which needs to be um, designed in order to be able to offer you actionable intelligence to be able to notify you as soon as possible that something bad has happened or is happening to enable you to react quickly and contain that. If you continue to believe that you've built strong enough security that you'll be keeping everybody out and the only place you need to focus is the perimeter then you're going to be absolutely blind to all the bad stuff that is you know, without doubt happening inside your network at, at some point or another. You want to get a look at the latest Verizon data breach investigation report from, uh, I guess, April this year. Um, the average uh, time between compromise and discovery in an enterprise scenario is more than 200 days. So people are simply not aware that their enterprise has been compromised and their criminals are simply wandering around inside um, taking information for a prolonged period of time. Oh my God, that's almost a year. That's, that's yeah. ridiculous in terms of what they're going to be able to gather. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned this organization that you are involved in that is looking at, um, in fact, the connectivity among all these things. So what are, what are some of the things you all are talking about? Can, you can we take a little bit of a future uh, or near future look at what, are, what is anticipated is going to happen as we get our smart grids up, as our e-health becomes increasingly connected, as more data is put on the systems? Um, are there things that we as enterprises or even as individuals that we should be thinking about? Uh, are there things that we can be doing? Can you give us some scenarios and then I don't know if yeah, there's yeah, a I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few. I can't divulge too many details because actually the no, research okay. paper will be launching at the Europol Interpol conference on the 25th of next month. So watch out for that, 25th of September. Um, and I can give you a little, little sneak preview. Um, we've Excellent. also we've been working on a, a very cool nine-part, totally fictional, but nine-part kind of sci-fi web series which we have uh, based on that research document. So on, uh, also on the 25th, we'll be launching this, uh, this very cool web series. We filmed it all already, and uh, it's, it's great. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but in terms of the stuff in... We heard it here first, folks, OK? Yeah. We're going to be watching out for that. Uh, it's called, the, the, the project is called Project 2020. Um, and in terms of the kinds of stuff that we're looking at in that document, um, certainly, we're going to see the rise, for example, of a content service provider industry instead of just an internet service provider industry. This will be another layer. You'll have your ISP providing you with the connectivity, but there'll be another la layer of CSP, your content service provider, who is providing uh, bespoke, tailored content to you, uh, which has been already pre-filtered and designed to appeal to your interests based on a profile that you've registered with them based on previous browsing behavior, based on your location, based on your health, based on any, any, any other data from any numerous amount of wearable tech sensors or a grid of sensors that belong to the city, the state, or enforcement, whatever it might be. Um, so the information will be increasingly tailored to you. Um, and if it's something which is you know, between you and the world acting as a filter, um, then, for example, you know, your CSP might know that you're not the kind of person that likes to go hang out in bars. I have no idea why that would be the case, but there are some people I hear who don't like going to bars. Um, so, for example, every time you walk past a bar, um, it might be simply masked with a, with a giant advertisement for the latest ski equipment because your CSP knows that you like going skiing. So you never see any more bars. They're not part of your world anymore. They're simply masked out in your heads-up display. So, so like I said at the beginning, I mean, it could actually be the first time where the internet has actually made our world a smaller place rather than broadening our horizons because it's something which is now 
getting in between us and the real world. And that, that's something to consider and a, and a potential real danger. It Absolutely. Begins to As you're describing it, I feel like all of a sudden we're, wait a minute, are you going to give me only the things I like? What is that going to make me as a human being? I think all of a sudden, I, as you said, I suddenly became a speck as opposed to able to have these sort of synchronous uh, events happening in my life, unless maybe they're going to be programmed in and then my entire life is going to be programmed. That's exactly what's going to, you know, an element of serendipity is going to have to be programmatically introduced into a world of that nature. Um, and, you know, you look at, at your online experience of today and this kind of stuff is already happening. The advertisements that you see on your social network are based uh, on your activities on that network and, and on partner websites. The, the stuff that you see in your webmail account is based on the stuff that you've typed to other people. Not, you know, not the websites you visited, but the interactions that you've had with other people. So this kind of stuff is already at base level now, and if it becomes something which is an interface between you and the real world, then the implications of it become that much bigger. Um, something else I think that we'll see um, is uh, the, the, a use of multiple profiles, a much wider use of multiple profiles. So you'll, for example, have your public profile, your family and friends, your gaming profile, a couple of financial profiles. Uh, you might have your official government profile for voting or paying parking fines or whatever it might be. Um, because you're going to have to authenticate yourself in some way to each of these services and, and profiles are going to be able to allow that tailored content to be delivered. But of course if you've got all those different profiles then another companion technology that becomes uh, unavoidable is some mechanism for switching between them, authenticating you as a person. So yeah, I'm logged into my public profile with all the information I'm happy with the whole world knowing, but now I need to pay a parking fine. I need first to authenticate myself to my official profile before I want to go somewhere and pay, pay for that parking fine. So that's another area which will be absolutely ripe for exploitation. Um, because it will be the mechanism by which we switch from, from one to the other. So instead of going to compromise individual profile providers, maybe I can compromise the switching mechanism. We already see it in a financial sense when criminals go after credit card clearing houses instead of individual merchants. Um, so it's, it's an analogous to that. Um, obviously more systems that come online, more systems that get interconnected, more opportunities for Hacktivism, nation-state sponsored badness, that kind of stuff. So if we're talking about medical facilities, if we're talking about electronic voting, you know, what, what better means to disrupt uh, a competitive state than disrupting their, their national election process, which is all digital now. Um, theft of um, components, for example. You know, we already talk about 3D printing. I've read talk of what they call 4D printing. Um, 4D printing being where um, 3D printed elements will then will go on to self-assemble after printing. So there's an element of time involved as well, hence the 4D. Um, and if business becomes more fragmented, you see online teams of people collaborating to make 3D printed objects which self-locomote in order to be um, uh, assembled at a third party location. So bigger corporations outsource component manufacture to specialized teams who are connected to 3D print and stuff gets remotely assembled. Obviously that's another area where criminal activity could interpose itself and begin to steal components. It'll be a great... I, I, I have to interrupt for a second because I have to tell you that I'm a futurist oriented person but you're creeping me out right now. Um, I mean what I'm thinking about is we can just uh, 3D print different elements of a bomb, of an explosive device, it can, it can assemble remotely and reassemble and self-initiate uh, remotely without us even doing it and we can probably, the networks that are going to be developed are also going to be able to appear and disappear on a flash and so you're almost going to not be able to trace who was responsible. Am I understanding this scenario kind of correctly? Yeah, those are certainly um, viable propositions of how that kind of stuff could be used. You move as everybody knows, I think we've already seen the first 3D printed handgun that is capable of firing projectiles. So, um, you know, components for anything. I mean, you know, there's, there's a really positive side to it as well in that I think in the future everything that you buy, and in the not too distant future, everything that you buy uh, should come with a set of 3D printable templates so that, you know, when a component breaks, you can make your own replacement. And if you can't fix it, you can at least have the component and take it somewhere to go and be fixed. So maybe we'll become a less wasteful society in the future is something we can certainly hope for. Right.
really astonishing. Uh, Neil Stevenson's Diamond Age book is one of my favorites, and he talks about this replicator, which when I read it 20 years ago, I was like, wow, that's the future. And here it is. It's happening right now. So just to Where's tie... my flying car? I'm sorry, please? Where's my flying car? Well, exactly. Yes, I've, I've been waiting. Or frankly, if we're going to do that, I still want to be up in space. I want to be visiting other planets and so, uh, and really go back to manned or womaned space flight, um, humankind space flight. I think that would be really astonishing. But we digress. Uh, bringing it back, we'll probably need more and more M to M to enable all these futures that we we're just talking about. So just to tie it all back up, um, just let's talk about immediate concrete steps that uh, to to close us out that companies can do when they're developing M to M networks, solutions, products that they can start really putting into place. I think you put something very key. You mentioned it earlier. Really combining your development teams and your security teams together. If you want to talk a little bit more about that or or any other ideas that you have, the company should be doing right now to make sure that we can start building as secure uh, systems out there as possible. That's, that's certainly the first, first and most important one when it comes to development of products and services and, and technologies and, and the implementation of those technologies is that cross-pollination of teams. So making sure that you're taking people, your employees, out of their current um, comfort zone, allowing people to spend, you know, people could learn a few good lessons from Google here, in, you know, where Google allows people to have project time, go work on their project time. Why not in, in those, particularly in those key areas of your business, say, hey, you people who are currently working in securing our infrastructure, you need to go and learn, or securing our products, you need to go and learn about how we make them, and I want you to spend one day a week with this team, and someone from this team wants to go and spend one day a week with your team. Even if it's just to um, allow them to educate one another and instill one another's best practice in those teams, um, but the more formal you can make it, and the more you can actually uh, invest time and money in that secure development lifecycle, the better it's going to be for you and for your customers. Um, when it comes to implementing technologies in a, in a commercial world, uh, when you are trying to um, look at your corporate security and see if you've done the right thing, uh, I think certainly now is the time to go back and look at your security infrastructure. Most of it was probably put in place a decade ago or more, and you probably said, okay, we have web scanning, we have email scanning, we have a firewall, maybe recently we've got intrusion prevention, but we look at all those technologies in isolation. Um, you need to make sure that you have some overarching technology uh, which will allow you to take those events from all of those different areas uh, and put them together into something meaningful and timely um, to make sure that you've got that retrospective security. Because like I said, breach will happen and the best that you can hope for as an enterprise is that you find out about it immediately and are able to contain it um, immediately. It's less now about building uh, effective uh, castles with high walls and ditches and drawbridges. It's now about building effective dungeons. You have to accept the reality that people are going to get in. You have to make it very difficult for them to get out again with what they came for. Interesting. Fascinating. Rick, thank you so much for giving us what we need now, a look into the future and also an understanding of what really is happening out there from a cyber crime and cyber security perspective. Thank you so much for being with us here on UDU Connect. Pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all so much for joining us. Please continue to come back here to RCR TV, RCR Wireless. We're always working to bring you the latest information of what's happening here in this ecosystems of the wireless connected world. And so thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back real soon.